Great. All right. Well, thank you for that introduction. Um, I will uh, be talking about these uh, endangered butterflies that I've been working on for a number of years. And in that process, certainly thinking about the plants the entire time. So um, you'll see a, a very uh, integrated approach, I think. So I want to start with just saying that I work with a lot of partners um, and collaborators. I'm probably not representing every single one on this slide, but um, it really takes a, a lot of people um, to conserve species. So the land owners, the managers, or um, regulators um, providing funding and um, access to reserves is uh, all important. And I will say that a lot of this work has been done uh, with uh, Douglas Deutschman. He was a, a professor at San Diego State, now is at Wilfrid Laurier University in, um, near Toronto in Canada. So we've uh, partnered and co-authored a lot of uh, papers together on these topics. So just a little outline of uh, the talk today. Um, this first part is was actually fairly interesting to me to actually put slides together and will probably go in some of my ecology lectures in the future. But I wanted to talk about the, the close interaction and uh, kind of intimate relationships between insects and plants. Then I'll go into some um, information about some of the endangered butterflies in San Diego uh, County. And then end with some ecosystem functions that insects are, are responsible for, and uh, specifically talking about uh, pollination and decomposition in our area. So with uh, insects and plants, like I said before, there's a, a really oftentimes a, a tight interaction or relationship between the two. And this is due to um, co-evolution occurring between uh, the two groups. And we'll see um, in a series of examples here where there'll be um, kind of a situation where there's really kind of a, a pairing between the, the plants and the insects. Um, and I think that pollination, especially when you have um, flowers with kind of a long tube structure, that is a pretty visible um, way to see this co-evolutionary relationship where you might have uh, different plants and flowers with different length of flowering tubes here. And that's going to match the proboscis length of the, the insect. So if the, the proboscis is too long, that insect can get the nectar, but it's not involved with pollination. So the, the plant would lose out in that scenario. If the proboscis is too short, the insect might pollinate a little bit, but they're not going to get the nectar and probably not return over and over again to that same plant. So that's a more of a, a visual um, example. When we start looking at different insect groups and um, who's related to who through these phylogenetic trees, and then overlaying some information about the plants they feed on, um, like this uh, group of butterflies, the, uh, some of the white butterflies here, you can see the color coding represents different feeding behaviors or uh, groups of plants. And you can see that the, the colors are not randomly distributed through these phylogenetic trees, but we have um, these butterflies, a particular species is gonna feed on maybe one or just a few plants. And then you go to a different species of butterfly, they're probably feeding on a different plant, but again, just one or two or three plant species. And the reason for that is that plants, and this is where your group probably uh, knows a lot more about this than I do, um, but there's a lot of these secondary metabolites or um, chemical compounds in the plants that are used in defense of herbivory. And so, um, you know, plants would prefer not to be uh, consumed. And so they have uh, multiple defenses. It could be something just simple, a deterrent. Maybe it's distasteful for whatever reason to a particular caterpillar. Maybe it's toxic and can actually kill it, or maybe more subtle and just starting to block the digestive process. And so there's lots of different um, of these uh, chemical compounds. And what we've seen is that the insects have to evolve adaptations to get around those defenses. And um, generally, a particular plant isn't going to have all of these defenses. It'll have one or two, 
And so the insect will have to deal with those one or two. And so that means that the insects over time are well adapted to feed on a small group of plants, but they can't go and feed on all the plants with all these different defenses. And so when I'm reading my um, uh, nighttime story to my two-year-old daughter, and I'm reading The Very Hungry Caterpillar, and they're talking about him eating an apple and two pears, three plums, and then strawberries and oranges. That's really not realistic because all these different plants um, have different compounds. And that one caterpillar, it's unlikely that it's developed the defense against all of those species. And one other interesting aspect about this plant insect um, interaction and the coevolution <clears throat> actually involves a, a third party. So oftentimes when insects are feeding on plants, the plants give off a, um, or release a chemical signal. And um, we have other insects, uh, parasitoids that have um, learned to recognize that signal and know that if they can sense that chemical signal, there's some insect feeding on the plant. And if you're not familiar with parasitoids, um, maybe you've seen the movie Alien and can have some um, reference to that. And I'll give you an example of the uh, life history of a parasitoid. Again, wasps are a common parasitoid. This is using an aphid as a, the example instead of the caterpillar, but same idea. The aphid's gonna be feeding on the plant. The um, parasitoid wasp will come through and deposit an egg within the aphid. And in step two, you can see here the larvae of the wasp developing in the aphid while the aphid's alive. So the wasp is feeding on live fresh tissue while the aphid goes about its day. Um, and it tries to avoid the vital organs to keep the aphid living as long as possible. So it's always got fresh food. Eventually, the host, the aphid in this case, could be the caterpillar on the, the left side there, um, that will be killed. And eventually that wasp, that parasitoid will emerge from uh, that insect. So interesting kind of further step in this uh, relationship. So as I mentioned before, um, I started off talking about this intimate relationship between plants and insects, especially herbivorous insects. Um, they really develop a, a really tight relationship and a, kind of a small food palette for what they're feeding on. And so for that reason, herbivorous insects can be a really good indicator of habitat quality because as the plants and that community is more healthy, you would expect higher diversity of insects. If the plant diversity is lower, there's gonna be fewer insects feeding on them. And so um, butterflies actually are one of the more widely used um, insect groups as indicators. And throughout Europe, there's been a lot of work over the last uh, several decades looking at how the butterfly abundances have been changing over time. Generally, what they're seeing is that the numbers are uh, decreasing, as you can see here on the graph. You can see the number of locations on the map where these surveys are being conducted. So some countries really bought into uh, this sampling design. So I mentioned before that any herbivorous insect could be used as an indicator, but I'll argue um, that butterflies are particularly useful. Um, eggs, caterpillars, and pupae in the life stage or life cycle, I should say, are usually not easily um, seen or observed. And that's true for most herbivorous insects. They remain on the plant. But with butterflies, they have a pretty um, bright, colorful, and active adult uh, stage compared to maybe like a grasshopper or a cricket that's less conspicuous. And so it makes it much easier for researchers to look at butterflies than some of those other herbaceous um, insect groups. So that's just a little bit of background about the um, insects and plants. And um, for the next set of slides, I'm gonna go through uh, some work that's been conducted and just some basic information about three endangered species here in San Diego County. And we'll see that uh, it's, again, really important to consider the plants and the plant communities. 
And then I'll talk more at the community scale, looking at uh, vegetation communities and insect communities. And so first with these um, three different endangered species, butterfly species, we're gonna see that there's a common trend that they all primarily feed on one plant only as caterpillars. And so that means that one particular plant is really elevated in importance. And often that's our first step in terms of researching these butterflies. So if an if a insect, a butterfly in this case, requires one food plant, then we know that's an absolute requirement of their habitat. And so that's often the first place we look at is where can we find this plant? And through follow-up visits and surveys in the field, we can determine if that particular butterfly is present. And so we use, um, or I've used <clears throat> uh, sources like Cal Flora or the San Diego Plant Atlas through the um, Natural History Museum here to try to figure out um, locations with the um, larval food plant. And that again, guides our initial searches. So first I'm gonna start with uh, the Hermes copper butterfly. And just some basics about its uh, biology. It is a summer flying butterfly. They typically are adults and active for about four to six weeks during the summer anywhere from mid-May to mid-July, depending on the, the annual weather. They will overwinter as um, eggs, and then the larvae emerge and feed early in the spring and pupate in late spring. There's certainly a, a difference between males and females in terms of behavior, and this is not uncommon in butterflies, but maybe a little bit more extreme than some of the other species. Males are highly territorial, they will often be found along roadsides or trails and uh, really remain in a, maybe a 50 foot stretch of that road or trail. And probably about 80 to 90% of your observations are of the male butterflies. Females, a lot more secretive, oftentimes more in the um, off the trail in the um, taller vegetation, perhaps resting, remaining more secretive, potentially um, uh, depositing eggs on. Uh, the plants. Their uh, habitat is coastal sage scrub and a little bit into the open chaparral, and they are only known as caterpillars to feed on the spiny redberry or Rhamnus crocea. As adults, they have a really strong preference for the California buckwheat or Eriogonum fasciculatum, um, but it's not a um, they do, it's a strong preference, but not a requirement. They can use other uh, plants for that nectar source. So uh, we've been really working hard at accurately describing the distribution of the Hermes copper. And you can see that in the county map here, the bright green is the conserved lands in the county. So our preserve system. Um, if we just focus on all the dots together and don't worry about color right now, you can see that this species is restricted to southwestern San Diego County. There are a couple historic records in uh, Mexico, um, I think just two of them. So most of our information is from a small part of uh, really of the world and even a small part of the, the county. Um, in the upper left corner, you can see the Cal Flora uh, picture and distribution of where Rhamnus crocea occurs. So you can see that their main or only caterpillar food plant is found throughout the uh, much of the state, but for unknown reasons, the Hermes copper is really restricted to a, a small area. Now, if we um, look at those uh, dots, you can see that most of them are color coded in black. Those are extirpated populations. We have pretty good um, historical data on those locations and know that they are um, no longer present. There's a number of them in blue that are um, unknown, although I do think that they are probably extirpated as well. And then the purple represents those current populations. And to tell the story, we can really break up um, <clears throat> the story into three eras. So probably from about 1950 through about 2000. So before essentially I started my research in 2003, we saw that development removed 
and led to the extirpation of some populations, including uh, Mission Valley, where they were reported. Um, also had a, a museum specimen with San Diego State University on the, the label, so they were found even there. In 2003 and 2007, we had some really large wildfires and they led to the um, extirpation of several Hermes copper populations. And really we've seen almost no recolonization of those areas, um, <clears throat> even though other butterflies have been able to. And then more recently, we've had some really dry weather and it appears that all the populations, except for those at the very highest elevations um, have been lost due to uh, the drought. So it's just been uh, really dry. And I'll touch on the fire and drought uh, in a second, but just a couple other um, graphs here. Well, one more graph um, showing the, the population sizes. Insects, they're kind of, I always interpret them as um, plants with wings. So if the plants are happy, the, the butterflies are gonna be happy. If the plants are not, not happy, the butterflies won't be either. Just like plants, a lot of insects um, fluctuate quite a bit year to year, usually based on the amount of precipitation. So we saw that in the, like uh, 2010 to 2015, but then we had that really extremely dry period and we saw their numbers at these uh, reference sites really uh, crash. And um, three of the four are at, we haven't seen any individuals recently and just a couple individuals at this Boulder Creek site. Um, however, we did um, locate a, a much larger population. It seems to be somewhat stable uh, currently, um, but really we're down to, because of the drought, I think just one, um, decently sized population left for the species. So I mentioned before, it's easy to focus on the adults and that's what we focus on the most in terms of butterflies, but you really can't ignore the immature stages. And again, that's where that is that really tight relationship with the plants. And so um, to just kind of highlight the, the potential threats, I wanna just go over the, the immature stages here real quick. The eggs, again, they overwinter, so they are on the underside of the branches, and obviously they can't move in the eggs stage. And then the larvae, they seem to feed on the very smallest and newest leaves, so kind of that tender vegetation um, in the spring when the, the plants are really starting to put on that new growth. So if we think about those two stages in terms of threats, um, Having the eggs attached to shrubs, that's fine when you don't have fire, but you can see what happens when fire rolls through. Um, I guess the, the fire season's almost 12 months these days, but um, typically, you know, it's kind of late fall, early winter. That's when they're the egg stage. They're, they just can't move. And so if the vegetation burns, the eggs are gonna go with it. In terms of the larvae, um, again, they need those fresh, kind of newly growing leaves that are really small. When it's really dry, we see that the uh, red berry just does not put on new growth. In fact, some of the years they were dropping all their leaves and even some branches as well. So if you are that caterpillar and need new leaves and the plant isn't putting on any new growth, you're really out of luck and have nothing to feed on that year. And that could lead to an extirpation of that population. So mentioned before, just one large known population remaining. So this species is really at risk of um, extinction. I had a couple hour meeting earlier today, with the wildlife agencies to discuss some uh, recovery actions. And so some of the ideas that are being discussed is captive rearing, whether that's in the lab or kind of a, a cage uh, situation in the field, it would provide an area for us to hopefully have a safe population from fire maybe even with some watering and irrigation, we can um, keep it safe from drought as well. Um, and it's possible we can use those individuals to um, recolonize certain habitats after fire or augment uh, populations. Also discussing translocations. So that's when we move one or individuals from one location to another to reestablish populations. And we, um, I have attempted this in the past, 
we've um, taken females and just released, um, sorry, captured them first um, and just moved them in one of these vials and released them at the release site. Um, also, we can induce females to deposit eggs on the red berry and then, and usually that's done in clippings in a little uh, cage. And then we move those uh, clippings with the egg on it to a living red berry shrub in the, the wild so that the larvae can emerge and have new food to feed on. So these are all potential um, techniques we might start using in the future. Okay, so next we're going, um, I'm going to talk about the, the Harvest and Dunskipper. And this we're going to see is another species that is it's not um, actually given endangered um, classification, but certainly uh, threatened with extinction. So more of a, a biological term than regulatory term in this case. Um, they are another summer flying uh, species. Um, and they will overwinter as a larvae in this case. And I'll show you a couple pictures, um, but they're actually pretty easy to find as caterpillars, which is a little unusual for butterflies. They are almost exclusively found in oak riparian woodlands where they feed on um, Carex spissa, the San Diego sedge. Um, and I'll show you uh, some of that, those examples in a second here. Uh, but as you uh, saw the name, this is a, a subspecies and there's some pretty widespread, especially in the Eastern United States, uh, pretty widespread subspecies. But in Southern California, Northern Mexico, there's a very isolated uh, subspecies. And that's the one we're focused on here with the Harvest and Dunskipper. Their habitat, um, since you're all um, interested in plants, I'm sure uh, you know what this plant is. So usually you have to peel back a layer of poison oak and then get through the second layer before you find kind of that opening in the actual habitat. This is a little bit more open on the left than usual because there was a fire just a couple of years before the picture and those oaks are still trying to um, reform those canopies. But they are found in again, riparian oak woodlands. They don't have to have running water all the time, but here on the right, you can see, again, another picture of the Carex spissa. The Dunskipper is sexually dimorphic, so you can see the male on the left side, a little bit more orange um, with that black streak on the forewing. Female, just a, a kind of a rich chocolate brown color with a couple light spots um, on the, the forewing. The caterpillars, again, thinking about insects and their intimate relationship with plants, they actually construct a home out of their food. So they will attach several, in this case, three uh, blades or leaves of the Carex spissa together and um, actually remain in that kind of shelter during the day and come out uh, at night to feed. So it's a way to uh, protect themselves potentially from predation due to birds. If you open up one of those kind of shelters, here's what you see, kind of apple green um, caterpillar. You can not open it, but just kind of peer down and see that striped head capsule looking back at you if you um, are interested. And they will pupate in that same location, fill the top with this kind of white cottony substance. Um, so finding those, I'll go back to the previous slide, finding these like 90 degree bends in the Carex spissa is actually pretty easy and then making sure they're kind of attached and then looking down and for the caterpillar or pupae, you can fairly easily determine their presence. Uh, their distribution, the Dunskipper that is, is in Southern Orange County through um, San Diego County, kind of through the foothills. Again, you can look at the distribution up top from Cal Flora and the Carex Spissa um, map. Carex spissa is a little bit more widely distributed, even north of LA and then again, north of, uh, I guess, Santa Barbara. Uh, but the Dunskipper does not uh, occur that far north. Uh, more recently, we've been able to fill in more gaps. So if you start from kind of the Silverado area in Orange County and follow those foothills down through San Diego County, um, that's pretty much their distribution. Um, there were some ornithologists down in Mexico that were uh, 
had an opportunistic photo um, and shared it with us. So we have that record as well. So of course, working on conservation, you wanna think about um, kind of updating what's happening at each one of these historic sites, whether they're there um, or if it was just um, many, many years ago. And so we revisited as many sites as we could. We found as many Carrick Spissa patches as we could and visited those during the um, summer to determine if the Dunskipper was present or not. And here's a map. You can see the, the current Dunskipper populations shown in green. Areas where they probably are present, but we could not confirm with an, a direct observation shown in yellow. So maybe we found an empty kind of um, shelter from the caterpillars, but could not actually find a caterpillar that would be coded as yellow. We do have some areas that have pretty good historic data, those and um, have not been able to find the skipper more recently. Um, and I think my numbers here in the parentheses are outdated, but we have several extirpations um, currently, some due to development, fire or drought, a little bit of combination. We'll talk about threats in a minute. Um, I'll skip down to the purple ones. We have some sites that are on private property, historic sites or observations that were on private property, or maybe it said something like Poway and we didn't really know exactly where that was. Um, so those sites were not surveyed. We do have some sites shown in black that just have the Carrick Spissa and we do not have any historical information on a Dunskipper. And so we don't know if the Dunskipper was ever present or not in those locations. Um, my guess is that some of these along the coast, they were never occupied. I think it might just be a little bit too cool for the Dunskipper. But when we start getting into the foothills, those sites probably were um, occupied at one time and actually would represent extirpations. But again, we just don't have that historical information. So I would encourage you if you are out and find Carrick Spissa, um, take a second to look for unusual 90 degree bends in the, the leaves, especially if you're out in the, the very late winter or early spring and see if there's caterpillars. So one interesting thing about dun skippers is that almost never um, do people see more than 10 individuals in a, in a day. And so that's really small population size. Um, you see after prolonged drought in 2021, my grad student is uh, revisiting many of these sites and uh, most of the sites had two individuals on a particular day, one of them had four. So those numbers are, are pretty small. Um, I will draw your attention to a couple larger numbers. Um, we had done some genetic sampling in the past, non-lethal genetic sampling where we'd catch an individual, remove a leg for the genetic sample, and then mark the individual and release it. Um, and some of those days we actually caught, um, you know, about 15 or 20 individuals in a particular day. So it does suggest that our kind of transect counts are underestimating the, the individual's presence. So that's also something my grad student will be addressing this uh, next summer. So some of the threats, again, thinking, about and interpreting butterfly conservation like uh, these plants with wings. Um, you know, the first one doesn't relate to that, but anytime you have small populations and a restricted distribution, those species or subspecies in this case are at elevated risks of extinction. Um, but we see that oftentimes our habitat has been altered. Um, Obviously fire, talked about that with Hermes copper, can be um, pretty detrimental. Um, the Carrick Spissa, again, is in riparian oak woodland, so they typically have a little bit more water and probably have, need more moisture. And so drought's gonna be um, certainly a, an aspect and of um, or potential threat. I'll also mention the gold spotted oak borer in a second on a slide, um, but also grazing. Um, some uh, with cattle could be a potential issue as well as they'll feed on the um, Carrick Spissa and obviously the, the bigger animals likely to win. So here's some pictures of what we sometimes see with habitat alteration. Um, 
you know, a lot of people like to be in the shade in Southern California, especially in the, the summer. And so oaks provide a lot of shade, um, but a lot of the understory is less desirable. So they really kind of get cleaned out. So you can see that here. I think this might be um, the Flynn Springs County Park. And so um, I think Dunskipper used to occur at this location, but obviously you can see that much of the native vegetation under the, the oaks have been removed. Um, and this, uh, I'll talk about restoration in a second, but I think restoration, and this would be a great site, um, could really have a, a positive influence on the, the Dunskipper. So thinking about drought, I mentioned before that the Carex is almost exclusively restricted to the understory of oak woodlands with riparian systems. They do quite well even during drought conditions. You can see here on the left, the plant's still green and it's really dry. Um, I think that shade and the canopy really help the, um, the Carex uh, survive. This plant on the right was probably 50 to 100 feet away, um, but it was outside of that canopy. And um, you can see it's on its way to dying and in fact is no longer present. So I think in really wet years, they kind of spread out and then real dry years are going to retract back to that canopy. Along those same lines, um, I imagine most people are familiar with the gold spotted oak borer, um, certainly capable of killing lots of oak trees pretty quickly. Uh, my concern, and this is at Crestridge Ecological Reserve, we see a, a tree that did or was killed in the foreground and some that are getting thinned out in the background. There are Dunskipper right in between those two large oak trees there. Um, my concern is that if we lose that canopy, it will start getting drier and the sedge will become less happy, um, perhaps uh, die out like we saw in that previous picture. So we certainly have uh, more research to do. We we'll need to uh, have a better idea of habitat preferences of the adults. Certainly the larvae need the Carex spissa in the oak woodlands. The adults typically are found out in the summer, I'm sorry, out in the sun during the summer. And they're um, sometimes nectaring on a number of different plants, but they often at one site congregate on maybe even just one flowering plant. Um, so they're selecting something that we don't really know uh, what that is yet. I mentioned the collection of non-lethal genetic samples. Um, I do want to uh, start assessing the connectivity of different uh, drainages across the county to see if those individuals are able to uh, move around and how well they are able to move around. And I mentioned before, um, I think restoration can have a really big impact on the Dunskipper. At Crestridge Ecological Reserve, probably five to 10 years ago, they put in plants, Carex spissa plants in that drainage. And um, about a year or two afterwards, we documented caterpillars on those plants. So they responded pretty quickly. And I know they've been putting in some upland flowering plants nearby so the adults can get some um, nectar as well. All right, so our, the third species, I'm gonna, actually another subspecies, third butterfly I'm gonna talk about is the Laguna Mountain Skipper. This is a, a little bit different species um, or, and biology in terms of the adults having two flight seasons. So they have kind of a, an early spring flight and then a, a summer flight. They will overwinter as pupae and so once they kind of complete that development, the adults will emerge and be ready to emerge um, as soon as it warms up. These are um, found in montane meadows um, historically, and I'll show you a map in a second. On Palomar Mountain and in the Laguna Mountains, they feed on uh, Cleveland's Horkelia. Um, there are uh, suggestions they could potentially feed on some other plants, but um, this seems like the only one that they can really um, complete development on. Again, this is another subspecies, so there's more of a widespread subspecies to our north. Um, but again, historically, the Laguna Mountain Skipper has only been found on Palomar Mountain and the Laguna Mountains, and um, actually has been extirpated from the Laguna Mountains. 
And we'll talk about potentially why that was the case and what's being done about it. So um, this skipper is uh, or occupies these montane meadows. And you can see a picture here sometimes in the spring, get a, a really bright, colorful carpet of uh, wildflowers blooming. You can kind of see that on the right side. One thing that's pretty consistent with most of the meadows that the um, Laguna Mountain Skipper is found in is that there's grazing. And that was identified as one of the main threats and potentially the reason for the extirpation in the Laguna Mountains is that um, grazing um, efforts, or I shouldn't say efforts, but pressures were too high and um, they ended up uh, feeding on most of the, the vegetation or uh, trampling the vegetation and or um, caterpillars. And so um, they are, the skipper is coexisting on Palomar Mountain in some meadows with grazing as well. And so um, there does seem to be some ability to um, have that activity and co with coexisting with the skipper. And so that was something that we looked at uh, several years ago to investigate what the habitat preferences were for the skipper and started to also kind of investigate the grazing aspect. And so some of our results, these are um, PCA um, plots. And uh, I'll just kind of walk through the, the 2014 one. So you can see we did um, sample in two different years. The circles represent each area of the meadow that we sampled vegetation. We took kind of a, a course approach, um, looked at the, the Horkelia, which is what the um, caterpillars feed on. So that's obviously important. Everything else probably in terms of species wasn't really important to the skipper, um, but the general structure of the habitat is. So we looked at the amount of bare ground, like the uh, herbaceous um, plant cover, leaf litter, um, shrubs, which are kind of calling intermediate uh, plants and then um, taller plants or you know trees kind of to break down vegetation based on height. And so these, um, the way to read these graphs is that if the um, circles that represent the different locations in the meadow are close to one another, that means their vegetation structure is very similar. The further apart the circles are from one another in the graph, the more different they are. And so um, we overlaid those dots and sampling locations with our vegetation. And um, these arrows tell you um, the kind of driving uh, factor for the, the spread of the, the circles. So it, for those plots that are higher up, these tended to have higher shrub cover. The ones furthest to the left had most um, bare ground. And the ones to the right had more uh, complete cover of herbaceous plants and leaf litter. And we color coded in these dots to represent areas that had the skippers and areas that did not have the skippers. And you can see that most of the locations with the skippers and the, the gray had more bare ground and shrub cover compared to those that did not. And that trend was true. There's some, some overlap, but again, we see some separation in 2015 as well. Just another way to uh, look at some of those data, kind of isolating those specific variables we found it to be important. Two of our sites, and these are actually two um, Iron Springs and then the, the State Park up on Palomar, they did not have cattle grazing while Mendenhall Valley did. And so we saw some differences with that grazing aspect. So in general, Again, the Laguna Mountain Skipper was found in areas with higher shrub cover. And if you look on the right, with more bare ground. And so what we think was happening is that in the Iron Springs and the, the State Park with the Lower French and Lower Doan Valleys um, and Meadows, they were um, attracted and most common in the riparian areas that had that medium sized plant or um, shrub component. In Mendenhall, um, there, again, it was gray, so 
there was very little vegetation that was um, any height at all. Like essentially the cows acted almost like a lawnmower in that sense. Um, and then bare ground, Mendenhall, because of all the grazing, has lots of bare ground. So there's very little difference between um, the sites. But I think what was ultimately driving it was the um, uh, ability to have some thermal regulation and that bare soil, as well as the uh, allowing for some flowering plants to come up through that bare ground, um, certainly helped uh, attract those uh, skippers. And just more, I guess, kind of more anecdotal evidence and relationship with the grazing. There, you know, if you think about grazing and if that's a, a potential threat, the, the natural thing to do would be to put up fences to keep cattle out. And that's um, what Forest Service did in Mendenhall Valley, at least part of it. And so on the right side is privately owned. Um, there are Laguna Mountain skippers shown by those red dots along the kind of um, forest line there. And then um, once you reach the Cleveland National Forest line here, they do have a, a grazing exclosure and a fence. Well, you can see that the skippers came right up to the fence, but rarely went over into the exclosure part. And what we found is that, and it's a little bit hard to see from this, just a, a picture compared to actually being in the field, but in the grazing area on the right side, again, they, the cattle really did a good job keeping the vegetation low, had more bare soil that allowed a lot of those annual plants to come up and flower. Once you get into the grazing area, it became knee high, pretty dense um, grasses, which they kind of overshadowed um, the, the other smaller plants that the, the skipper needs. And so it does seem like some grazing would be beneficial um, in this case. So thinking about recovery efforts, um, this is a, an actual uh, activity that I'm not directly involved with, but currently they are in the process of reintroducing Laguna Mountain Skipper um, individuals to the Laguna Mountains. So um, hopefully um, those will be successful and there will be um, two areas, kind of the two historic ranges with the skipper once again. So those kind of uh, summarizing some of our endangered butterflies here in the county. Hopefully you see that at least some of the native plants are quite important for um, the success of those butterflies. Um, for the next set of uh, slides in this next section, I'm gonna talk more at the, the community level, both for insects and the vegetation. <clears throat> so there's lots of, or I should say several conservation plans in the county, uh, multiple species conservation plan being one of them. And um, this plan along with many others, as you can see with the um, red underlined section here, have the um, goals of conserving both the diversity and function of the ecosystem. And so being an entomologist, I'm not biased at all, but I would naturally think that insects should take a, a certainly a center stage here. You can see from E.O. Wilson's book, um, roughly 53% of species known on earth are insects. So if you're trying to conserve biodiversity, you can't ignore insects because they represent most of it. Certainly plants make up a, a high proportion too. But when you get into some of these conservation level decisions, management plans, conservation plans, uh, Endangered Species Act, um, you see that the insects are underrepresented. So again, on earth, they represent about 53% of species, but oftentimes, lower levels on these, um, these plants and in conservation. And there's a lot of good reasons for this. There's so many species of insects, it'd be hard to um, take each one individually and work on its conservation. The fact is we have a hard time identifying many of them, let alone knowing anything more than uh, what species it is. So there's certainly some um, challenges dealing with insects and that's uh, the reason why they are one of the reasons why they're underrepresented. 
But instead of just taking a species by species approach, insects really perform a lot of important functions in the ecosystem. These are just some of them here, um, including predation. Most um, other animals feed on insects or feed on something that does feed on an insect. So they're, um, again, pretty important for that food web um, related to plants. Uh, some insects are important uh, dispersers of uh, seed, certainly pollination, um, and uh, I'll talk about decomposition. So trying to return some of those nutrients to the, um, the soil. And I'll just uh, kind of touch on pollination real quickly because that is certainly a, a hot topic. Um, here you can see a picture, a photo shoot that Whole Foods and Xerces Society um, conducted years ago looking at a produce section of a grocery store with bees and then what it would look like if we did not have bees, just to show the importance and our reliance on bee and other insect um, pollinated services. The um, US government did um, in 2015 put out a, a report and plan to address some of these pollinator issues and um, just after that, the United Nations brought together many pollinator experts um, and kind of summarized the health of our pollinators and the implications. And you know, if you're not so concerned about the, the natural systems, um, we see that these pollinators are gonna have a, a, certainly an influence in our um, agriculture and food supply. So um, certainly something that we could be uh, paying a premium on in the future. So there's uh, several insect pollinators. I'm not gonna um, go into detail on the, into too many of these, um, but a lot of different insects visit plants um, and certainly should not be under the impression that bees do um, it all. And some plants um, do not benefit at all from uh, bee pollination. They actually need others, um, but certainly bees play a role and a, a large role. For our insect decomposers, a little bit simpler, and you'll see in the, the results that I present from some research um, with the lower diversity involved with decomposers, a little bit easier system to work on, and we are a little bit further in um, our research. So the, uh, the main goal of what we wanted to get to in this study is looking at the habitat quality and that functioning. So you would expect with high quality habitat, you would have many species down here on the X axis. And if you have low quality habitat, you're gonna have fewer species. Um, and if you have those high quality habitats and many species, you would expect your ecosystem functioning to be high, whatever that is, could be pollination at low quality your ecosystem functioning is going to be low. And so thinking about how that rate changes as our habitat quality is degraded, um, I think is important to describe. And ultimately, if we have all the time and money in the world, we can figure this out and have kind of a threshold we could implement and say, all right, this is our trigger. We've dropped below this level, we need to restore it. So that's kind of the, the approach of this research. And we certainly see that with San Diego County, we have a, a very diverse landscape, a lot of urban areas, but we do have a lot of small pockets of native and somewhat native and some non-native um, areas, as you can see here, just two examples. Oops, sorry. Even within some of our larger preserves, we have fairly um, healthy habitat and what we would say is degraded or non-native um, habitats as well. So we wanted to um, look a little bit more into the, the insect communities, specifically those that are pollinating or decomposing, and then assess the relationships with that habitat quality or land cover, those vegetation communities. And eventually we wanna to try to quantify those rates so we can actually kind of go back to that graph and rebuild something like that. So with our... Um, pollinator work, we um, did conduct um, sampling around these three plants, but today what I'm gonna really focus on is the otai tar plant work. Um, 
you may be wondering why the heck would you be interested in California buckwheat? Well, it's found everywhere, so we can find that in all preserves across many different landscapes. So that was a, a benefit of including that. And we don't have quite have the, the results yet. So with pollinators, and I think I'm going a little long, so I'll kind of just get to the, the point here. Um, we use these colored uh, cups, kind of a, a modified bee bowl, and place them in patches of the otai tar plant. And they're just filled with soapy water um, that helps the, the insects stay in the cup. Um, and you can see Don says it helps save wildlife. So that's exactly what we're trying to do, help save the, our communities. Had, um, I think it's 20 different uh, preserves across uh, San Diego County, focusing on coastal sage scrub and grassland communities mostly. And what we found with our sampling in the Otai tar plant first is that across two years, we saw that the bloom period certainly was quite different. I think 2015 was extremely dry and the Otai tar plant was flowering from early March to early May. And then in 2016, it was from early May to early July. So we saw um, a, a pretty good shift and that's going to allow us to investigate some of these phenological matches or mismatches. If the plant starts flowering in different times of year, do the pollinators react similarly or different? Um, and so we certainly saw some changes in insects from 2015 to 2016. Some like this uh, beetle decreased while butterfly or lepidoptera, these are mainly moths, increased in 2016. So we're already starting to see some changes or differences, I should say. But we really wanted to take the plant approach and perspective. Here's a, a graph overlaying two sites in two years, and I'll just focus on the, um, the lines. In 2015, we have the red line from Rancho Hamul Ecological Reserve and the green line from Rice Canyon, which is in Chula Vista. We see that the number of these beetles peaks during the peak of the bloom period. And so these seem like they could be really good pollinators. So their numbers are highest when the, the flowering is at its highest. Um, in the 2016, the blue, we still see a little bit of a curve and then Purple is kind of flat line, but maybe there's a little bit of a, a curve there. So we see that maybe a pretty close pattern in the two years. And we're going to contrast that with our moths. Um, in 2015, we have the red and green lines, kind of even numbers of individuals. But in 2016, with the blue and purple lines both increasing, we're seeing a, a different signal. And it could be that um, the moths are increasing in 2016 at levels that could be efficient for pollination, but never did that in 2015, a very dry year. Um, and so we may be starting to see some uh, phenological mismatches between the flowering of the plants and the insects that could potentially um, pollinate them. And then finally, just wanna to touch on the decomposition. Um, we put out these bucket traps for about a week. They had a rotting rat carcass in them to attract the insects that decompose our small mammals. And then we also did um, field trials to quantify the rate of decomposition. Um, it was a paired design, so a rat carcass in each of these cages. Cages exclude the mammals, didn't want to include the scavengers. And then one was put in a fine mesh bag to restrict insect access, but allow for things like evaporation. So that was our control. And we took, a, again, a broad uh, approach. So um, I believe all of California has a vegetation and land use um, GIS layer available, the Holland Code. Um, <clears throat> it is hierarchical in nature, so we can get really refined, but we took more of a, a coarse approach so you can see Based on that code, we kind of condensed all sage scrub together, all chaparral, all native grassland, for example. And we looked at the area around the trap. So the trap locations represented by the X, we calculated the percent or proportion of the area uh, 
within 100 meters of that trap that was each of these vegetation communities. So you see in this example, most of it's sage scrub with some native grassland. Well, we did this at a number of spatial scales, um, 500 meters, 1,000, 2,500, and 5,000 meters from the trap location, because we didn't know what scale was important for each insect um, group. But we did kind of settle on 5,000 meters as showing some of the, the clear patterns. Again, I'll show you uh, one of these PC, um, PCA uh, graphs showing the, in this case, kind of the differences in the insect groups. So we saw a lot of beetles kind of clustered together in terms of their variation in abundances. So sites that had high, there's basically sites that were good beetle sites and we had other sites that were good fly sites. So we started to see that separation. The beetles really liked the native shrublands and really did not like urbanization. So you see the beetles clustered close to areas high in sage scrub and chaparral, low in urbanization. The flies did not show a, a tight relationship. And we can see some of these a little bit more in detail. Some of these beetles, like the burying beetles, higher abundance with low urban land cover and as the amount of land cover to, um, composed of urbanization increases, we see their numbers drop. Similar trend with the hysteroid or clown beetles, um, but not all insects share that pattern. And maybe not surprisingly with Argentine ants, we start to see them show an increase with increased land cover. And that's been pretty well documented. So not surprising that insects change when you change the vegetation. If you think about that tight relationship I discussed early on, but we wanna know what's it doing to the, um, the decomposition rates or our ecosystem functioning. So again, we had those field trials where we um, set out paired rat carcasses. And you can see that after the um, study, sometimes it was hard to even see any remnants of that um, carcass in some of our more um, native shrubland areas. And we got more urban, more of that carcass was remaining. And we can um, see a pretty clear correlation between land cover and reduced decomposition and really urbanization and sage scrub is um, negatively correlated. So it's either urban or uh, sage scrub. So it's one or the other, which is why we're seeing these uh, very similar trends. But again, increase in our native plant cover we see an increase in our decomposition. So it does suggest that those native plant communities are important for the functioning. So um, hopefully I've clearly shown that as a, at an individual insect species, especially the herbivorous insects, sometimes there's just one or two plants that are really critical for their existence. But as we kind of scale up those insect communities in general, and those that are involved in some really important ecosystem functionings are um, really reliant on our native uh, plant community. So, uh, oops, sorry. I think I showed that with the decomposition. We're hoping to investigate that with pollinators a little bit more. And there has been some work done with our um, horn lizards in San Diego. This is actually not the right species, but um, as those Argentine ants replace native ants, um, they found that the nutritional value is not equal and the, the horned lizard cannot survive on um, Argentine ants alone. So again, as a food source, really important to maintain that uh, native community. All right, so um, I guess we do have time for um, the Q&A and chat, um, but certainly if you have questions at, um, down the road, feel free to reach out to me. My email address is here. Um, Happy to answer questions. Thank you so much, Dr. Marshalek. That is absolutely fascinating stuff. Thank you. Um, we do have a few questions. I'm gonna start with the questions that are coming from the Facebook streaming. Um, Craig asks, how long does the wasp egg stay in the aphid? Uh, good question. I would imagine that the um, the larvae emerges pretty quickly. Um, I couldn't give you a, an exact uh, 
number of days or something like that. But my guess is under a week. I would think they'd have to get moving pretty quick. Okay. Um, but, the, but the larvae could stay in for, uh, I think, weeks, sometimes over winter. I guess okay. that it would be maybe a pupa at that stage. Um, he also asked, do we understand why the Hermes, sorry, my speed went away. Uh, do we understand why the Hermes copper is wedded to the Ramnus crocea? Not really. I mean, I could just give a, a general, um, you know, description about how they've kind of through time evolved to, to feed on that one plant. Um, there is suggestion that their closest relative is in Southeast Asia. And so there might be some kind of carryover from some other coppers and butterflies in that area. But that's, I think, still work that needs to be determined. Okay. Um, kind of on the same vein, Mark is asking, is there much difference between the white checkered skipper and the Laguna mountain skipper? Um, the white checkered, I think, is pretty common, and I would guess it feeds on a, a number of species. I don't know if he's talking about biologically or um, morphologically in appearance. Um, they are pretty similar in appearance. So you, certainly have to take a close look at each one. And that's when we're up there, that's the, the biggest decision we have to make when we're doing surveys is which one is it? Um, but yeah, it's certainly more widespread. I would imagine it feeds on more, uh, a wider variety of plants as well, which would help it um, expand its range. Okay. Um, Natalie is asking, in your opinion, does herbicide have a place in open space management of in invasives or are herbicides too harmful for pollinators? Um, yeah, that's a good question. I will, um, you know, I've spent a good amount of time in the Midwest. I'm actually restoring part of my yard into tall grass prairie, about two acres. So I have a appreciation for uh, plants and the, the habitat as well. And, um, you know, if Southern California really has a, an exotic plant issue. I mean, it's, it's really bad there. It's not quite as bad here. Um, and so, you know, if you lose all the natives, you're going to lose all the pollinators anyways. I mean, maybe that's a little extreme, but not too far off the truth. And so um, you, you should be careful on how you use them, but you know, there's a, <laughs> I guess you have to break an egg or, you know, to make an omelet. So yeah. <laughs> it's, there's going to be a trade-off, but try to be responsible. Okay. Um, Ashley is asking, she says, um, I saw some reports over the last few years that the California overwintering population of monarchs are really doing poorly. Do you see that as an indication that the San Diego environment is unhealthy? I mean, I, you kind of touched on that already, but. Yeah, that one I haven't been too involved with. We did go out a couple of years um, in the winter to look at some of those historic overwintering sites. And honestly, it was really hard to get out on a day where it was cold enough based on protocols. And so there is kind of this, I, you know, I do wonder, and I, I haven't been heavily involved in this so take it with a grain of salt but kind of wonder especially down here if it's been so warm that they don't really need to overwinter like they have historically in the past and you know we see them flying around in other areas in December and January so um, I do believe that the numbers are decreasing but I also kind of wonder if they're more diffused across the landscape as well but that's just speculation okay um Somebody is saying that they recently drove from San Diego to Eugene, Oregon, and they found their car window windshield was covered with bugs in Oregon, but not while driving in California. What accounts for this difference in insect population on the windshield? That's not an uncommon discussion I've had, <laughs> to be honest. Uh, a lot of people tell me back in the day, and I remember it too, where you drive and have to clean off your window every 10 minutes and now you don't. Um, I've heard good and bad things. Um, 
you know, oftentimes you just hit a pocket where there's a whole lot of them, um, often around waterways. Um, sometimes when you get degraded, I'll stick with the aquatics, um, degraded waterways, uh, things like midges, they really become extremely abundant and they're really the only thing left. And so as we maybe we're seeing some of our waterways get cleaned up a little bit, um, it might balance out the number of insects in the, the water and reduce those large swarms. So sometimes those large swarms are actually a, a sign that, I wanna say it's like unbalanced, but you know, you have a, a maybe a non-native or a very um, tolerant, you know, pollution tolerant species that's doing extremely well because it's the only one that can live in that bad area. Oh, okay. Well, that's maybe a little bit of good news then. Again, Take speculation, and I can't really, you know, without knowing yeah. what was hitting your windshield, right. answer okay. that. That's not bad. Um, Kay is asking, what is PCA? Oh, it's principal component analysis. So it's a, a way to display lots of variables on one graph, essentially. I don't know if you want more than that, but the it's, you know, basically just the interpretation, the easy way is, you know, the further away the, the dots are from one another, the more different they are, if they're close together, then they're kind of more similar. Okay. Um, Valerie asks, what is your favorite insect? They're all oh. good. Uh, <laughs> I've always liked tiger beetles for some reason. Um, you know why? Just attracted to it, or you? They're there... they're hard to catch. Okay. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> kind of like a prize, a trophy. Right. Um, Cynthia is asking: um, Is the Hermes copper butterfly listed under the ESA? So they've been a candidate species for ten years. Um, so that means that U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service has determined that they are. I think they're going with threatened, but they haven't provided a, a formal final ruling yet um, that could occur any day now, but it could also continue to be delayed for a while. Okay. Um, so they're kind of, they're in between. Okay. Uh, Cindy is asking over on Facebook, uh, the cattle in the Laguna Mountains sometimes hit the vegetation very hard. What management changes are being required for these areas to permit permit butterfly reintroduction? Yeah, I know they have some exclosures up there, but again, I haven't been directly involved with the, the reintroduction. So I'm not, I think they are keeping cattle out of those areas, I would imagine, or at least being a little bit more careful. Okay. And Stephen has um, a suggestion for you, I think, let me see. In case you're interested, if your grad student hasn't been to the area, have them check out the Saber Springs Trail, part of the unfinished C to C Trail. The area east of Black Mountain Road until Poway is riparian habitat with lots of butterflies, particularly near the 15 underpass. Are you familiar with it? Yeah, we've we've been in there for Hermes Copper work actually. Um, I'm not sure if we've looked for Dunskipper or not, but um, I was actually trying to write down notes of, of this location as we're answering other questions. So um, we'll certainly try to get somebody out there. And if anybody knows of actual Carrick Spissa and wants to send a very detailed um, location to me, you know, we can usually get somebody out there to kind of check. Oh, so, excellent. Um, yeah, certainly we get many valuable tips. Um, from just people being in the right spot at the right time. And, you know, even with me and a, a small field crew, we could not cover the entire county. <laughs> so it really helps yeah. to, to get advice from others. Excellent. Well, everybody says thank you for the presentation. Um, people think it was excellent. You definitely gave us a lot to think about and a lot of information. Thank you so much for all your work that you're doing out here.
yeah, it's, it's fun and good system to work with lots. You never get bored. Yeah, that's for sure. Um, thank you all also in our audience for joining us this evening. Thanks for all your great questions. Uh, remember that this presentation was recorded and will be available soon for your viewing on both our chapter Facebook page and our YouTube channel. And you can get all of that information on our website, cnpssd.org. Let your friends know, let's spread the word about these endangered butterflies in our area. And uh, don't forget, this Saturday is the Native Plant Festival at Balboa Park. I hope to see you there. Have a good evening, everybody. Thank you again, Dr. Marshalek. Thank you.